Welcome to the 37th episode of our podcast series for advisors considering the independent space. Today's episode is Rockefeller Private Wealth Demystified, a conversation with Chris Dupuy, Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer for Rockefeller Private Wealth. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, and on wealthmanagement.com, as well as iTunes and other resources. There are few conversations with top advisors where the name Rockefeller doesn't come up. Rockefeller Wealth Management is one of the hottest brands to hit the street in decades. It's the story amongst advisors serving a high net worth and ultra high net worth client base. The cachet of the Rockefeller name, no doubt, serves to fuel the excitement, but it's industry superstar Greg Fleming at the helm and the community of advisors they've brought on that's the real drivers. Greg's plan is to take the firm to new heights with lofty goals of growing its assets under management from, as of this recording, $18.6 billion to about $100 billion in just five to 10 years. How is he going to achieve this goal? One part is in the leadership dream team he's putting together. And my guest today, one of the firm's most recent addition, is no exception. Chris Dupuy spent nearly three decades with Merrill Lynch, starting as a financial advisor and rising through the ranks to become the leader of Merrill's private banking units, wealth management branch offices, and international private client hubs for the Pacific Northwest. In 2014, Chris left Merrill for Focus Financial Partners, where he was Managing Director and President of Focus Independence. Chris is part of a growing breed of wirehouse leadership breakaways who are moving with the tides, jumping from the big brokerage world to independence. I'm excited to have him here to share his journey, as well as some inside baseball on Rockefeller, the role he plays in this super exciting firm, and what lies ahead. So let's jump right in. Chris, thank you so much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Mindy. I've really been looking forward to it, so I appreciate you having me on. You bet. All right, let's jump into the questions. So after a 29-year career at Merrill, you became one of the first senior leaders to leave the wirehouse world and join the independent movement by choice. And I emphasize by choice because I think until you left Merrill, the majority of wirehouse leaders we saw move toward independence had been either asked to leave their firms or otherwise um, found their ways themselves there by default, but you were different. So what was behind that decision and what made you join Focus Financial at the time? Well, it, you know, it was the hardest professional decision I had had to make in my career to that point because I had grown up at Merrill Lynch and, and had always been proud to be a part of Merrill. But when the industry changed and, and Merrill Lynch changed and Bank of America came on the scene, I really felt that the direction that Bank of America was intending to take Merrill Lynch was really not in the best interest of the advisors and the clients that I had grown up working with. So ultimately, it it led me to do some due diligence into the industry, my position versus other things that I might do. And I was introduced to the head of Focus Financial Partners at that time, and we literally went back and forth for about a year talking about the state of the industry where things were going. And ultimately, I made the decision to leave Merrill and, and join Focus. Okay. And then you left Focus and joined Rockefeller, I guess, just about how many months ago? Uh, I joined at the beginning of November. Okay. So what was that decision about? Well, really, for me, the the decision came down to, you know, even though it's a big industry, it's still an industry that's built on relationships. And I felt that the combination of being able to work with a, a brand like the name Rockefeller, which right off the bat, to me, was very exciting, coupled with the opportunity to work with some old colleagues from my Merrill Lynch days who I both respected and liked a great deal. That combination was very powerful to me. And as we had some discussions, uh, the role that uh, the Greg Fleming and Chris Randazzo created for me, I really felt was one I could make an impact positively on the industry. And so ultimately, uh, for me, it was the right decision and really thrilled as to how things have begun. Okay, so let's get to it. Rockefeller, certainly one of the sexiest names on the street and a firm everyone is talking about. 
Could you talk with us a little bit about Rockefeller's value proposition? And I mean, one of the first questions about it is, we know it's an elite club, if you will. So who are the ideal prospects and what is the value proposition of the firm? Sure. Well, we are uh, we're committed to creating one, an, an advisor-centric and a client-centric culture that will really allow sophisticated, experienced advisors to kind of get back to their roots, you know, think like entrepreneurs, uh, wake up every morning enthusiastic about coming up with sophisticated, customized strategies for their very best clients and, and working in a firm that's going to be supportive of trying to help them really fulfill whatever the need the client might be. So I start with that, Mindy, because you know, in many ways, the major firms have kind of moved away from the individuality and the customization that many of the most experienced and successful advisors in the industry have enjoyed and built a reputation on through the years. And and we feel that's created an opportunity for us to give them the destination where they can kind of get back to the roots of really dedicating themselves to their clients first. So how does Rockefeller differ from others in the space? And I'll tell you what I mean by that. You know, as we describe the landscape of the industry, which has expanded a lot in the last number of years, the category that's probably expanded the most is this quasi-independent firm, a firm that allows an advisor to have much more freedom and control and independence than he or she may have had at the likes of Merrill or Morgan Stanley or UBS but not as independent as having to go out and build their own. And Rockefeller falls into that category, albeit a very sophisticated high-end version of it. So how would you say Rockefeller differs from others in the space, like Stewart Partners under the Raymond James umbrella, like William Blair out of Chicago, like Jeffries out of New York, et cetera? It's a very good question. And, and that was what we felt was the greatest gap within the industry that we could fill. First, one of the things that we stress with, we're committed to remaining small. We take the term boutique seriously. Like, like you said, whether it's a private club analogy, a private plane analogy, we have X number of seats and, and we don't ever intend to surpass that. And so as a result, we're really you know, thorough with our due diligence. We view the exploration points, uh, a two-way process between both advisors and our firm, where we really want to ensure that an advisor that may be considering Rockefeller uh, that it's right for them and it's right for us. And so so we're only looking at experienced advisors, advisors that have demonstrated a track record of growing, that have sophisticated client bases that we think will benefit from the combination of both what we're building in the private wealth space, as well as the existing resources within the Rockefeller family office that, is, that has served that family so successfully for over 100 years. And we feel we pull all of that together under the unique brand that's so well known and, and resonates positively with the ultra high net worth client, uh, the, the Rockefeller family name. We just feel it's a unique opportunity right now for advisors to become part of something that they're truly proud of and allows them to deliver in a very customized fashion. And you'll, you'll hear me use that term customized a lot because I think you're right. If you look at the spectrum as you know, on one hand, you have the major firms like Merrill Lynch, where I came from, you know, now a part of Bank of America. The other end of the spectrum would be just complete independence, where someone goes and starts their own shop. We are probably closer to the flexibility of the independence side. However, we are an RIA. Uh, we have our own broker-dealer. And part of how we're approaching things is if we restrict ourselves to working only with the most sophisticated senior advisors, we feel we can be really supportive of their entrepreneurial thought process and the solutions that they provide to their clients that are customized. Got it. And so let the audience know, we are recording this the beginning of March, and this episode will likely air sometime in April. But as of today, can you give us some perspective? I know you've had a lot of early success. What does that look like in terms of how many people under the Rockefeller umbrella, how many advisor teams have you recruited? Sort of where are you at today? Excellent question. And if I can, I'll take just a, a quick slight step back. So what Greg Fleming took over a little over a year ago when he decided to come in as the CEO of Rockefeller Capital Management, there was an existing business there, a 135-year-old business. It was the family office founded by John D. Rockefeller for his family's needs back in the 1880s. And so that business was very successful in and of its own right, $20 billion or so in assets under management, you know, 150 or so employees. 
significant revenues. It was a very successful family office business, primarily but not entirely dedicated to the needs of now the, the seventh generation of the Rockefeller family. And so the business that we came in enthusiastically to create, and by the way, with full endorsement and support of the Rockefeller family itself, was designed to create a private wealth organization that would be national in scope and would include really the elite advisors from all over the country that could then be able to represent this brand and this new business that we're creating. So it's a very interesting combination in the sense that this it's this 130-year-old brand Yet it's a brand new private wealth venture within it. And so uh, so you're right. In the, in the last several months from standing start in the private wealth space, I laid out a footprint that includes hubs in, in six major markets. So New York and Atlanta on the East Coast, San Francisco and Los Angeles on the West Coast, Dallas and Chicago targeted in the middle of the country. Uh, we have actually gone live with advisor teams in New York and Atlanta at this point. In fact, one of our earliest hires was Michael Outlaw, who was a very senior leader for Morgan Stanley in the Southeast. Michael's based in Atlanta and overseeing what we do in the eastern half of the country in our private wealth business. And he, through his contacts, actually has had tremendous success in seeding and getting the Atlanta presence for us started. We have five teams already that have joined in Atlanta. Two joined in December from UBS, and then three have joined here in the new year uh, from Merrill Lynch. We also have a team, our first team, uh, it's the Bappas Group as part of our New York City presence. It's actually based in our headquarter office at Rockefeller Plaza, and that team joined in October. So we are fully live, a functioning platform. You know, we've put together compensation plans, product matrices, a platform that can execute on all of the needs of the ultra-high net worth clients that these te- teams bring to, uh, to Rockefeller, and we're very excited and pleased with the progress that we've had so far. But Uh, we still feel there's much to do. So it's been extraordinarily exciting to watch you build it. It's exciting every day. We sort of, it's a name that's on everybody's mind. And it's exciting to watch the press releases as you begin to recruit successfully. And one of the things we know is that having early success in a model is pretty critical. Because a lot of times we've seen a lot of firms that struggle to bring on those first advisors, and it can sometimes be a year or two before they do. And it sends a message to the market that it's a less than optimal model, and that's not a good thing. So what do you think accounts actually for this early success, for making people like Bappas moving from Hightower, the teams from UBS? What do you think it is about Rockefeller that really gave them confidence that, albeit a 130-year-old brand, but a new model was worth joining? It's a variety of things. I do think it's not the stock and bond or the asset allocation business that we're in, but we're in the relationship business. And I think advisors seeing Greg Fleming at the top of this company as our CEO and and knowing his history first with Merrill and then with Morgan Stanley, know that he is someone who's committed to the space, who's a winner, who is dedicated to creating a successful environment for advisors. So I know that that was a positive uh, right off the bat. Uh, Speaking for myself, when I saw Greg's initial team that he announced, all of them industry veterans, one, uh, successful individuals, two, and then three, simply great professionals who were people that I knew personally and respected and wanted to be around, uh, you know, the team has had a lot to do with that. And you know, between myself, Greg, and Chris Randazzo, who runs all of wealth management and technology for Rockefeller and who brought me on board, uh, we have nearly 100 years collective experience in this industry, just the three of us. And uh, you add Michael Outlaw to that, and now we've added many others since. We've created a team with a strong network and and good visibility within the industry. That certainly was a start. But then if you talk to the advisors, the two words that you hear most frequently that they bring up that was really the impetus for them to join us in these early days and and with confidence go to their clients was a combination of exclusivity and flexibility. And both of those words are in short supply today, particularly at the major firms. And so that's been become a foundational part of what we try to represent when we're out talking to both advisors and to clients. I love it and sounds right. How about the economics? Because we also know that no matter how much an advisor can be 
jazzed by joining an elite club that offers exclusivity and flexibility, no matter how much they might have loved and respected Greg Fleming and his rock star leadership team. If the economics aren't right, if making up for an advisor's unvested deferred comp, uh, giving them the economic excuse to jettison the traditional space behind, what of the economics, what can you share, uh, share with us as that relates to the advisors that have joined? Mindy, that's obviously an important part of this process for advisors and for Rockefeller. And so as we began to talk with advisors, we knew, particularly given the fact that we were talking with very senior advisors in the industry with track records of growth and success, that we needed to be quite competitive with respect to the transition compensation offers that we were going to put in front of them. And so that you know what we've arrived at, we feel, is among the most competitive in the industry right now. We do value businesses based on both trailing 12, meaning recent revenue results, as well as, you know, very important to us, a trajectory of growth that's led to their current production. Uh, and we look at that very carefully, as well as the mix between fee-based versus transactional. While we are very much committed to a fee-based fiduciary model for working with clients, we do have our own broker-dealer, so we're able to support transactional business as well. But once we get a really good understanding, we put a valuation on that that we agree on with the team, and ultimately we come up with a transition compensation package that would include a combination of upfront money based on the trailing 12, as well as earnouts typically you know, a couple of years after they've joined, that would allow the advisor to get some skin in the game and to be able to benefit from their future revenue growth, which we believe is what we're going to be able to help them drive, given how we're we're setting up to operate here. Got it. So is the firm completely ready for prime time? Is it fully built out? We know it's sort of in the early days. Are there any aspects of technology, platform, or anything that are not quite there yet? Actually, no. The exciting part of what I've seen, and again, this was another part of my personal due diligence in joining Rockefeller, uh, you know, Chris Randazzo was a very close colleague of mine in my Merrill Lynch days. And to me, there isn't a better person to oversee building a new technologically driven, nimble, advisor-friendly, client-friendly platform than Chris Randazzo. And so right now, table stakes for us is if an advisor joins us from a major firm, They need to, with confidence, be able to walk through the door knowing that they can deliver on any solution that they're currently providing at their old firm for their clients the same way that they would be with Rockefeller. So we right now have a platform that they are able to execute and deliver solutions to any ultra high net worth client or high net worth client. And a big part of our due diligence is obviously getting into very specific client needs and capabilities. And if we don't have it yet, we build it. One of the the upsides we have of starting from a standing start several months back is that we actually, in in Chris's case, you know, he's got a blank sheet of paper to be able to create a platform on. He's not being, he's not beholden to legacy systems and trying to build around or over that, which can create sort of a clunky system that some of the major firms suffer from. So right now we're able to do that, but then there's another aspect to, to what Rockefeller offers to an advisor and their clients And that is access to the resources and the intellectual capital that served the Rockefeller family for over 100 years through our multifamily office. And that's been a a meaningful part of the puzzle for these advisors as well. Yeah. You shared with me offline a while ago what some of those family office capabilities are. And I'm wondering if you take a minute to give us some specifics around what they look like, the family office capabilities that Rockefeller offers. And the reason I ask is because in the P big unit of Merrill or the private wealth units of firms like Morgan and UBS, they talk about being able to offer family office-like capabilities. So wondering where the difference lies. Yeah, I think the the key difference, having been a part of Merrill at a fairly senior level and aware of you know some of the fits and starts and trying to build some family office capabilities there, some of which were successful and some of which weren't, uh, what I would point to here and part of what attracted me to Rockefeller was the fact that this is a family office. In fact, it, you know, a individual line of business is our multifamily office. You may have seen recently that we've announced he hasn't joined yet. He's on on leave currently, but Tim O'Hara is going to be joining us to run the multifamily office in the next uh, you know, month plus. But the capabilities right now that are being delivered to our, our clients within the family office of Rockefeller include tax preparation and advisory. Now, we do returns, we provide advice, 
on a very specific client-to-client basis. We also provide what the firm refers to as client accounting. I still use sort of the slang term bill pay. Uh, But for those families with very sophisticated and complex needs, uh, we're able to actually step in and provide those sort of customer accounting needs that many of the ultra-high net worth families benefit from. We also have two trust companies. We have a national charter and we have a Delaware charter trust company and are able to do all that you would expect the needs of an ultra-high net worth family would expect from you know, an estate planning perspective in the world of trust. Last but not least, we also provide very high-end uh, financial planning and cash flow analysis. That is the suite of services, which then also plugs into our investment management business. We are actually creating an individual line of business for Rockefeller Investment Management, which has become sort of a quietly successful line of business for us and, uh, and is one we're quite proud of. They, uh, we are open architecture at Rockefeller in our private wealth business, but all of our advisors do have the ability, should they choose, to, to utilize the services of Rockefeller Investment Management. So those five capabilities are at the core of what the family office has been doing for the Rockefeller family and others for over 100 years now. Got it. Chris, what do you think Rockefeller looks like five and 10 years from now? We're excited about that vision. You know, as, as I mentioned, we're committed to remaining small. You know, we would define small by you know, maybe nationwide 100 teams, you know, give or take a uh, you know, dozen one way or the other. In all of the major markets, we want to be a national presence. We feel the brand resonates in a way that will allow us the, the ability to do that effectively. So we will be, you know, in each of the hubs that I described to you, my guess would be no later than the end of the third quarter. And then each of those hubs will have, you know, very specific spokes that go into the appropriate markets that you would expect the Rockefeller brand to thrive in. So, for instance, New York City's hub will, in all likelihood, uh, have a spoke into Boston and into Greenwich and into North Jersey and San Francisco will go into Silicon Valley and up to Seattle and Bellevue, you know, as examples. So, you know, you would expect, uh, you know, several very successful, experienced, sophisticated teams to be in our hubs themselves. And then, you know, a couple of private wealth teams that will sit in the spokes in these key markets also. You put all of that together, we'd like to think that we could have 250, 300 advisors among those 100 teams, and you know, all of them very unique and successful in their approach, and all of them very conversant in the needs of the, the high net worth and the ultra high net worth. And what's extraordinary to me is that if Rockefeller had launched 10 years ago, and you said, we want to have 250 advisors in the next five or 10 years, everybody would have thought you were, you know, what were you smoking? But the truth of the matter is, in today's world, what Rockefeller stands for is exactly what so many advisors are looking at. So what sort of feedback to that end are you hearing from the advisors you are recruiting that you're in dialogue with as to life at their firms and the motivations for exploring a move or even considering Rockefeller? Yeah, I mean, that that obviously is part of our opportunity as we view it as well within the industry. There's such frustration. Typically, it starts with the whole story of compliance to the lowest common denominator, making it really difficult to get things done at the major firms. Turnaround time on requests is lengthy at best, and typically the no isn't because it's something that can't be done. It's a no because there's just simply a concern that it's outside of the box of where they want to take their respective businesses. And there's really an effort on the part of the large firms to homogenize the advisor's practices into something that kind of is one size fits all. And you have these teams that have spent decades creating reputations and personas that their clients identify with. And a lot of that is based on customization and entrepreneurial thinking. And that's where many of these advisors have the most fun day to day. And as that gets stripped away, It's just creating a tremendous amount of frustration. And so if you're a senior advisor and you're concerned because what you've always created in terms of client expectations is all of a sudden in jeopardy, you almost have no choice but to do your due diligence. And so that's where we come in because what we found is that if you're at a major firm and you start thinking in your mind what the conversation with your client would be like as to where you're going and why if you made a decision to leave the major firm, being able to introduce the concept of of Rockefeller Private Wealth as a brand, there's no necessary explanation as to who we are. And in terms of what we're creating, that entrepreneurial 
mindset and emphasis on client-centric solutions for the high net worth and the ultra high net worth, it's a natural gravitation of one's practice. So we're hearing this, you know, really it's a, a thirst and a desire to restore some of the fun back into this business that 12 years ago when things started to change as an industry. And we feel that's part of our opportunity. And, and culturally, if you were to talk to Greg Fleming or Chris Randaz or myself, one of the things we're most excited about is, is the ability to change this industry in a really positive way by creating the kind of a culture that we all used to be so proud of and it's just harder and harder to find today. Yeah, we see that here for sure. But despite the traction Rockefeller has had and the enormous pipeline you've built still, many advisors who spent a lifetime at a brokerage firm and loyal to brands like Merrill or Morgan or UBS believe that the independent space, the RIA space, just can't support an ultra high net worth focused business because the technology is not as good or because the platforms and services aren't quite as robust or because a client will have a problem separating from the big brand name firms. And so how would you respond to that? Well, there's a few points in there worth responding to. You know, one is I'm constantly reminding advisors that they're sitting in a very good position right now if they're successful, if they've built these wonderful practices with lots of client loyalty through the years and great reputations. And by the way, when you feel good about things and when things aren't broke, and I actually, I encourage advisors, that's the time you do your due diligence because you're not being driven by emotion or anger and you can really be thoughtful about your process of comparing where you are versus the alternatives. 10 years ago, or maybe even five or six years ago, there was a gap where the independent space and smaller firms like ours and the boutique space were unable to compete from a technological platform standpoint. That's really dramatically changed. I learned that in my five years in the RIA space. Uh, what's going on with respect to some of these fintech companies and some of the capabilities that have been created by the businesses like Rockefeller today is really remarkable. And so today, you can actually have a far more nimble and, and capacity-creating platform by moving away from the large firms where you have these legacy systems, and they're trying to be a facilitator of business for tens of thousands of advisors. We're capable of really putting together something that's much more meaningful and conducive to the individual needs of the advisors. So I do think that has changed uh, over the last several years. And you know, I'll be honest, it is still going to be different. And not all advisors like different because, you know, with change comes some discomfort. And that's why we feel it's, it's you know, particularly important as we continue to refine and, and hone and add to our platform that we never lose sight of what we want to be, which is advisor-centric, client-friendly. And much of what we're doing right now, Chris Randazzo has recently added a number of former colleagues of his to continue to build out things like our client portal uh, so that they can access account information and intellectual capital in the ways that many of the firm, the bigger firms provide. And we're really enthusiastic about how we can make it a very personal wealth management experience for the clients. But are there things that an advisor couldn't replicate? There are a couple. So for instance, one of the things that I, I try to let advisors know right up front if a significant portion of their business today involves uh, equity syndicate, you know, the retail new issue business, they're probably not going to see that kind of deal flow with us. And we don't intend to build out those capabilities either. So if that's a meaningful portion of an advisor's business, we're, we're probably not the place for them. If someone's not sort of in the, the stage of, you know, or approach their practice where they just want to maintain what they've built, that's not as interesting to us either. We really want to try and facilitate folks who have ambitions to grow their practice by being creative, by being entrepreneurial, and, and finding new clients as a result of the resources and the doors that we can help open for them. So now we just compared sort of life at Rockefeller and advisor at Rockefeller to those that say, I might be better served at a wirehouse. But it is equally often that we hear from advisors that if they're looking at Rockefeller, they are absolutely also considering the notion of going independent and building their own. And so the obvious benefit of building one's own is having 100% control, owning 100% of the equity. And the real benefit of owning 100% of the equity is ownership and control over when and how you sell that business and capturing all of the upside. How would you respond to those, or what would you say to an advisor that is weighing, do I go out and build my own independent enterprise, or what of joining as an employee of a firm like Rockefeller? 
Yeah, you're right. I, I run into that frequently. Not necessarily someone who's gone deep into both, but who has begun their due diligence and is trying to sort out all of these various paths that are available to them more today than probably ever before in the industry's history. What I tell folks is, depending on their mindset and how they want to approach the industry in the future, there isn't necessarily one avenue that's better than another. They're simply different. Uh, What I found in in the five years that I spent deep in, in the RIA world is that it is a very complex approach if you are going to start your own firm from scratch, creating a legal entity, building your own platform, creating your compliance infrastructure, regulatory checks and balances, and while all the while maintaining everything that you need to do from a, a, a client management standpoint. It's, it's simply a lot. Now, there's some folks out there that they just thrive on that. You know, they're the ones that want to know how the watch works, you know, not necessarily just what time it is. They want to get under the hood of the car. And, and when you're someone like that, and that's really what you desire to do, there's a variety of ways that you can go about that, and it can be very rewarding. What I found, though, is at least, you know, and I, and I was an advisor when I got into the business, and, and many of the advisors that I talk to today are, are peers of mine and around my age have been in the industry a while, is that there's far more advisors out there that really want to continue to do what they've always done best and enjoyed the most, which is develop and create new client relationships and, and help those clients succeed by coming up with sophisticated and creative solutions for them in a variety of ways. So yes, they want more flexibility, particularly as the big firms continue to pull in their horns. And yeah, they want to be treated as business owners and entrepreneurs and given the leeway to do what's necessary to grow their practices and and treated like senior successful professionals. But they like having a brand that's recognizable. They want someone who's dedicated to building the platform for them. They want to know that there's due diligence going on to put best-in-class providers in front of them to help them execute their business on a day-to-day basis without having to build it themselves. So I've just found that there's far more advisors that find themselves in that boat than the ones that want to just go create it all from scratch. And, And so for those advisors that do recognize that there's a benefit to having a firm behind them and a brand behind them and and a leadership team that's really committed to you know, putting them in a position to succeed and to win and, and who have done it before and, and have sat in their seats. That's what I feel is so exciting about what we're creating right now. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. We say to people all the time that there's no question that the long-term economics of building and owning your own business and being able to sell that business on the open market, the numbers can be quite compelling. But despite how compelling it is, it isn't for everyone. And that is why this sort of bucket, if you will, of quasi-independent firms that allow advisors more freedom and control than they had as employees of a wirehouse, but less than they would if they had to go out and build their own, has been doing so incredibly well. Yeah, you put that perfectly. That's exactly how I see it. So aren't there specific traits or characteristics of the advisor that, in fact, you think might be best served joining an established firm like Rockefeller versus building his own? Uh, That's a good question. When I think about the advisor who is sort of right down the middle of the fairway for us that we think would be ideal, it's someone who's been doing this successfully for quite a while, in many cases, more than 20 years and you know, has a sophisticated skill set and have clients that are sophisticated and have complex needs. And you know, they're the ones right now most in danger of being disenfranchised as the major firms continue to take more of a homogenous approach to how they view advisors. So those individuals to me who have built these big teams and these big books of business and have these very complex, significant relationships with clients and are still out there in the landscape looking for new relationships – most of them just simply don't have the capacity to then shift gears and become the CEO and the chief operating officer and the head of technology and the head of compliance and all of the things that are required of someone who's starting their own firm. So some of it is some soul searching on the part of the advisor. In fact, some cases they sort of start out thinking, gee, wouldn't it be great if I did start my own firm? But when they really start peeling back the onion and looking at all that's going to be required of their time, what they arrive at is that, you know, gee, this could actually take me further away from my clients than bring me closer to them. And so some of it has to do with really what does the advisor enjoy doing the most within the industry. 
What does he want to be when he grows up, right? Right, yeah, yeah. And if the answer is, you know, it's working with clients, it's growing, it's helping them succeed by using the skill set that they've developed over decades in the industry, you know, we feel what we're creating in our private wealth space really is the best model out there. And, and, and you know, that's our opportunity to continue to build on. Yeah. So what do you think the future holds for firms outside the big brokerage firms, firms like Rockefeller? Do you expect the breakaway momentum to continue? I do. I've always looked historically at the industry, and typically the greatest change has happened historically in the wake of the big event. And we're still in the wake of what took place 10 years ago. At that point in time, you had these four superpowers within the wealth management space, and the advisors really consolidated there. And you know some of the names now that you read regularly having recruiting success, if you had said eight or nine years ago they would be major players in the industry, most of us probably would have laughed at that thought. So there, there's really been a dramatic change that has changed the landscape with respect to where advisors ultimately are going to end up. So when I look at the major firms, they really seem to be on sort of this you know, determined march towards financial supermarket. I think there'll be compensation changes that happen as a result of that, that reflect that change in strategy. And I think they'll still continue to have thousands upon thousands of advisors, but I think they will be quite restrictive in terms of what they can and can't do for their clients. You know, and as a result, the, the senior most advisors are going to continue to vote with their feet. And so that's good news for firms like ours and, and other firms that have historically been viewed as you know, the smaller firm or the more regional firm or whatever the case may be. In our case, we want to be a a boutique that creates a culture of growing advisors that are sophisticated and having a lot of fun and and winning by delivering good results to clients. And I think there's so many advisors out there with an appetite to get back to that kind of a culture at a time when it's harder and harder to find. So I I do think this evolution within the industry is still very early on, and, and you're going to continue to see this play out for the next five or six years. I love what you said that if 10 years ago we had told someone that the firms that are having the greatest recruiting success today were the ones that were beating out firms like Merrill and Morgan and UBS in terms of recruiting, we all would have left. Yet it's really true. And I think what I tell people all the time is that what's changed the most is advisor sentiment. The things that are most important to advisors today are very different than the things that were most important to advisors years ago. Or said another way, all those things like freedom, flexibility, control, like acting as a fiduciary might have been important, but there was so little choice in terms of where an advisor could practice 10 years ago that he wasn't really able to sort of capitalize on those desires, and today he can. So let me ask you one final question, Chris. What advice would you want to share with quality advisors at traditional brokerage firms who are thinking about exploring their options elsewhere? And you mentioned one already, which I loved, that if you're going to explore options, do it from a position of strength, meaning when you're gainfully employed and not unhappy, not terribly unhappy, or not being pushed out the door at a time when you can take the emotionality out of it. But what other advice would you would you offer our listeners? Well, the advice would be sort of a play on what you just reiterated, which I I believe in strongly. But advisors really need to take an approach to their practice in much the same way they take serious the due diligence they do on their clients' portfolios. They're constantly doing due diligence on portfolios to ensure that they have the best managers, the best results, that they're positioned the best, not for what's happened in the last couple of years, but moving forward. And and that's what their clients rely on them for. But I think sometimes advisors take for granted that their clients also rely on them for ensuring that the firm that they're working with is going to be the one that allows them to continue to deliver the best results. So you constantly, as an advisor, should be doing due diligence, not just on portfolio positions, but also on the place that you go to work every morning to ensure that you truly are in a position today. And also, as the industry changes, and and let's face it, changes are only constant in this industry, that is going to put you in a position to continue to deliver the type of results and experience the clients have come to expect from you. And in doing that due diligence, if you start to question it, that's when you need to take these next steps and and have conversations, not just with us, but with a a variety of folks so that you can constantly be in front of that. 
I couldn't agree with you more. And I thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your insights, some transparency and a lens into the Rockefeller story, which we are excited to see grow and expand more and look forward to continuing the dialogue. Well, me too, Mindy. I really appreciate you having me on. And and this sort of a, a forum is terrific for the industry and for advisors. So I'm glad that you're doing it. Thank you. So as Chris says, it's the most experienced and productive advisors who are at the greatest risk of being disenfranchised at the biggest firms. And as such, firms like Rockefeller have an enormous opportunity to win the race for top talent. In our next episode, I'll be speaking with Rob Bartenstein, the CEO of Kestra Private Wealth Services. Rob has an interesting story about how he took his experience from the big brokerage firms and redefined the best of it in the independent space. He'll share why he and his partner created Kestra PWS, what made Kestra Financial the right platform for this turnkey model, and how this hybrid RIA has become a popular landing spot for breakaways. I hope you'll join us. Until then, I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 908-879-1002 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. Thank you for listening. I also want to thank WealthManagement.com for sharing this podcast with their viewers and subscribers. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.